The Get Rich Slow Club podcast is a collaboration between Tash Etchman from Tash Invest and Anna Christina from Perla. The Get Rich Slow Club acknowledges the traditional custodians of the land we record on. From coast to coast, across land, waters and communities, we pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. Any advice is general and does not consider your financial situation, needs or objectives. So consider whether it's appropriate for you. Welcome to the Get Rich Slow Club podcast, where we take you from beginner to confident investor, where we can teach you everything you need to know about investing. So come get rich slow with us. We have a bit of a different episode for today. In December, we hosted a live event in Sydney called How to Not Work Forever. We spoke about side hustles, investing, increasing your income, starting a business, and a lot more. Here's the recording from the event. Hi, I'm Anna Christina. I'm author of a book called Kids Ain't Cheap. I also work at Perler, head of product and community. And I do a podcast with Tash called the Get Rich Slow Club. And um, that's, yeah, that's me. What's your your version of not work forever? Not working forever. Um, Not working forever is being able to have security and some passive income so that I can work on my passion projects. And I think for a lot of us, we have passion projects that might bring in money or they might not, but having that flexibility, having security is so important for me. So that's my version of not working forever. Hi, I'm Tash, um, Tash Invest Online. And I do the podcast with Anna, the Get Rich Slow Club, which is super exciting. Uh, Am I not working forever? I think it's just the option as well. I think I really like working, but I want the choice to work. Hi, I'm Brandon Vanderkolk. I run the YouTube channel, New Money. We just launched a new education platform as well, New Money Education. So that's kind of what I've been up to at the moment. And my not work forever is similar to yours because I think I will keep working because I just enjoy what I do, but it's about freedom, um, being able to work when you want to and do what you want as well as working on projects that, yeah, mean something to you. Hello. (laughs) Um, My name's Emma. I run a platform called The Broke Generation, which is a financial education uh, podcast, socials, website, and soon to be a book called Good With Money. And my version of not working forever is kind of similar to what these guys have said, having freedom, choices, stability, sort of particularly for me, breaking generational patterns of instability, maybe providing something different to different experience, different level of um, choice and security for any offspring I may bear. And also being able to do things like volunteering. So I volunteer for my um, local health center at the moment, only like half a day a week, because that's like all I can afford to reserve. But if I didn't have to work forever, I could do some more of that. So that would be nice. Lovely. Okay, so first things first, we don't have any sort of secrets to tell you about not working forever. This is not going to be that easy. But I think the way we thought about having this conversation was sort of in three key parts. So there's saving and budgeting, obviously, um, and then there's investing, and then there's your self as a business, your personal brand and how to increase your income. We're not going to spend a heap of time talking about saving and budgeting is a really important thing, but it, it kind of goes from zero to a hundred in terms of granularity and everyone's got a different day to day. So um, if there's something on your mind, let's explore it later. But we're going to talk mainly about investing from different perspectives, people on the panel, and then we're going to spend a fair bit of time talking about how they've turned themselves into their own businesses and how you can learn from that and how, you know, in a way the new economy means we're all our own business and how to invest in yourself. Okay. So hopefully that sounds good and hopefully we do a good job of it. Um, we're going to start straight away, I think. And so maybe not to pick on anyone, but Tash, why don't you tell us about your investing journey? Yeah. Awesome. Um, I started investing when I was 18. My dad luckily told me to buy the S&P 500 index fund and the ETF IVV, which is a great choice. Um, so I put a thousand dollars in and I was like, wow, that's pretty exciting. And then from there, I decided to save for an apartment in Perth. So I spent heaps of time saving. And then after that, I just started putting lots of money into ETFs. Yeah. And um, you know, your, your perspective is your own, but I guess maybe it's a question of show of hands. How many people in this room's parents told them to buy an S&P 500 ETF as their first <laughs> investment? Anyone? Anything? I see a nod, yes. <laughs> yeah, one. One out of about 60. So, like, that's pretty remarkable. Um, I probably haven't had that conversation with my parents yet and I do this for a living. So, um, <laughs> what, what, like, what was that like and, and, like, why do you think your parents were like that and what made it easy and, and, and I guess what made it that you didn't sort of turn around and be like, well, I'm going to do the opposite of what you said? Well, I kind of was looking for the information anyway. Like I knew I wanted to work in healthcare, but there's an uh, an income ceiling to working in healthcare, obviously. So I was like, cool, how do I make money? And investing was the answer. Um, So I was speaking to my dad about it. 
the first thing he told me about shares, I was 10 and I was asking him what shares meant because I heard all the adults talking about shares and he tried to explain it with a tomato sauce bottle and was like, you can buy one tenth this bottle. And that made no sense for years and years. But it'd always been a conversation growing up. It wasn't like a new thing. What about you, Brandon? I didn't really have anyone talking about investing on the stock market. Um, I studied physiotherapy actually when I was at uni. I finished that degree and started looking for jobs and I realised unless I was going to start my own practice and start my own business, which I wasn't really keen on in the physiotherapy realm, uh, that my income wasn't really going to be what I was hoping um, to generate. So I started looking at ways to, you know, once you get your paycheck, turn your money into more money. That kind of led me to the stock market. You know, I started looking at some YouTube videos and doing some very silly things. I, you know, very young and naive and feel like I'm invincible. And I started buying a whole bunch of individual shares, uh, which is definitely not the way to go when you're first starting out. Uh, and I got, uh, I got taught that lesson pretty quickly. <laughs> so after that, I kind of just so well, I, first of all, I spoke to my uncle who works in superannuation and he kind of guided me in. Yeah, nice start, Brandon, but, you know, ETFs, maybe just to stay diversified. Don't put everything into one company, that kind of talk. And that was really helpful. So I started looking into passive investing. That's when I got into, you know, learning about ETFs and I still am a passive investor. Kind of through that early stage of investing, I kind of found the Warren Buffett strategy as well. And I thought it resonated with me really well. And from there, I just started learning more and more, reading his annual letters and author Phil Town. Um, he made a couple of books, which are really good kind of Warren Buffett books aimed at beginners. And that got me really into the Warren Buffett strategy. And I started paying more attention into individual stock analysis, um, very long-term, still very rational kind of investing. What is the Warren Buffett strategy? Um, it's the strategy that Warren Buffett uses. No. Uh, it, I, I always, it can be summarized in four key points. And the first is to understand the business that you are looking into. Then after you've found kind of businesses in your circle of competence that are close to home, align with your values and interests and that kind of thing, then you look for a competitive advantage. If they have a competitive advantage, then you move on and analyze the, um, the management team. So management, obviously makers or breakers. And then if you feel like you've got a good management team, company with a competitive advantage, then you hone in on the valuation and, uh, you know, you're looking for a margin of safety. Basically, you're just looking for, you You run valuation methods like discounted cash flow, and you're just looking for companies that are smack bang home runs. It's just very obvious. If it's not super obvious, I just kind of don't bother. If it's there and it's it ticks those boxes and the valuation says, yeah, look, this is pretty, this is pretty juicy, then that's when I kind of get interested. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds fairly complicated. Yeah, it is. And to, to like, just to quit, I, I'm very much still a passive investor as well. And I think most people should be so. A lot of my, you know, investing is still just ETFs, very boring. I think I just have an interest in the Warren Buffett approach. Was there a book or a YouTube or something that you found really made it click that others in this room might? Yeah, so um, definitely uh, I mentioned Phil Town. The book that I read was called, uh, is called Rule Number One. Uh, and that was a really good summary of the Warren Buffett strategy uh, with really actionable steps. A lot of the investing books you read, they kind of gloss over like, oh, you know, high level, high level, high level. With this book I read, it really broke down those four key pillars and said, okay, now you're looking at a competitive advantage. This is how you stress test whether they do have a competitive advantage. This is what you need to look for in a management. This is how you look for it. Um, this is how you run. He doesn't quite do the discounted cash flow model, but something similar, relative valuation he, he looks at. So yeah, I definitely recommend that book. Okay. And sorry, it took a long time there. No, I think it was it was good. So what was it? Rule rule number one. Rule number one. Rule yeah. number one. Emma, was there similarly like have you found something that made it click for you? I think to be honest, <laughs> dare I say it, social media. <laughs> I know that it's slightly different about the things you can talk about now, but I sort of on my financial journey, investing and wealth creation wasn't really on my radar at all. I didn't really know that that was something that was available to me. I was on a mission to pay off debt. And um in sort of immersing myself into personal finance, I realized that there were like everyday people like Tash talking about how they had investments and how you could get into the market a lot cheaper than I kind of thought that you could. So there was a lot of, I think it was much more of like a drip fed expansion of my financial perspective that really got me into it because it was just this thing that even if I knew how to invest, you know, with Perla or Raise or whatever platform you might use. I think I got in with the micro at first. It was much more around, like much more getting my head around the fact that 
that was something that I could do and longer term, something that I could work towards. Like what does dividends mean? How does this actually, how is this different to having savings? Cause I'd never really had that either. <laughs> so to the thought of having not only no debt and sort of getting to that baseline of zero and not being completely volatile all the time, then that next level of like, oh, maybe I could have security. Maybe I could grow my money. Maybe I won't be on this, you know, shitty salary forever. That was a learning experience, but also a perspective thing because it just I just didn't know it was available to me. Was there anyone or any group of people you followed that made it happen? I'm trying to think now because I feel like it was it was talked about quite a bit back in the old school debt free community. Do you remember that in like 2017, 2018, 2019? I think that because the micro investing platforms and like more modern things like Perla were kind of really growing in popularity on social media at that time, it wasn't sort of like a specific thing someone said or a specific person I followed. It was just that this thing that I'd never, ever heard of just started popping up in my life. And then, you know, I read The Barefoot Investor and that kind of thing. And I, I don't know that there was like one sort of one sort of key thing that I can recommend because it was much more of a slow. I sort of knew about investing for a couple of years before I did it. And even then I sort of rocked around town with $100 in raise <laughs> for like a year maybe until I started to get because it because it, it was that sort of it's like learning a new language almost. Does that answer your question? No, I think so. I mean, I think this is more of like you know what we're trying to explore here is you know what are the things that made the difference and you know if we go through and, and I'll get to you in a second, but you know Tash, you had a pretty interesting relationship with your parents on it, and Brennan, you went on this kind of weird journey and you've gone quite deep into some things, and Emma, you've kind of sort of learnt by osmosis. So I guess um, until it like was just that much of a, a momentum thing around you, it seems, and that you just were like all of a sudden doing it, right? So I guess Anna, my question is, forget all this. What's a sensible way for people to invest? You don't want to hear my story? Um, yeah, from your perspective. A sensible way to invest. I guess like my, my story, like I found fire is what, what I found as, as opposed to investing. Because for me, it was I've always saved money to travel. That was my passion. That's like what I wanted to do. And then I saved up money and had more money because I had a better paid job. And what do I do with this money? And that led me down the fire path of like financial independence, retire early. How many people here are investors? Yeah. How many people have not invested yet? Cool. How many people know of FIRE? Okay, cool. So uh, for people who don't know, financial independence, retire early. It's kind of a movement where you focus on investing. And the idea is that your investments will, if you invest 25 times what your expenses are, the idea is there's this study, it's called a Trinity study, which means that that money essentially wouldn't run out if you take out 4% each year. So you would, you would be able to retire early if you do that earlier, as opposed to waiting to 65. Did that make sense? Did they explain that? I feel like I've explained it so many times that I've uh, like gloss over yeah, a part I like of it. The fun, the fun math example, where if you invest a million dollars and 4% of that is $40,000 a year. So that's pretty cool. If you want $80,000 a year, then you invest 2 million, which is fun. Yeah. So the, so the goal in fire is essentially to, to, to reach your fire number, which might be your expenses times 25. So when I had some of these savings, I was like, what do I do with savings? How do rich people make money? And I started Googling what to do with money, how to invest money, how to, how to make your money make money, which got me down to Mr. Money Mustache, which is a really famous blogger in the US about fire. And he's like the original blogger that kind of breaks this down. He retired really early. And at the time, like there wasn't a lot of information. I think at that time, there was not a lot on social media. There wasn't a lot around investing. And the idea around that was, a sensible way to invest is to invest in ETFs, exchange traded funds. And they're basically a basket of shares. So instead of being like, oh, who's what's going to be the big share? Like, who should I invest in? How do I make a lot of money? Is it Tesla? Is it Apple? Is it this? You just literally buy all of them. And guess what? You're going to be average. And that's okay because average usually has a decent return. So that that's the kind of idea around that. So that's how I kind of got investing is like, how does my money make money? And so I kind of jumped on the bandwagon around fire and that and that ideology. So like maybe to put it in a slightly different way, you weren't actually seeking investing. You were seeking a lifestyle and and that community that you found had this method, right? Yeah. yeah. So, okay. I think maybe maybe 90% of the room are investors. So maybe we can step it up a bit. So let's assume this room is fairly sophisticated. They're, they know what ETFs are. They have a portfolio and, and they're on the path. They're doing it. I guess any of you keen to hear thoughts on like how to keep investing 
interesting or engaging if you're already doing the thing and you're investing in the same thing for the last five years like why does do it have to be interesting i don't know oh, i'm just curious human nature we're like what we want something new we want to explore we want to grow yeah what do you do mine's all automated now i think when i was trying to make it interesting i bought like a hundred different ETFs and I wanted to change my mind every week, which wasn't ideal, but now I've just automated it and it sits there and it is quite boring, but that's good. How many in your portfolio? Too many. <laughs> I if, only if, actively if buy, this late clean. I only actively buy one now. I just picked a diversified ETF to make it easy and simple now, but I've got all the other ones from before that just hang out there for now. Yeah. No reason to get rid of them for you. They're all the same, really. Like it's like three different types of the ASX 200, really. Like they're all the same. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I was I was going to say literally the same thing. Like when I started investing and I was overwhelmed because I was like, I don't want to make do the wrong thing. And I wish I just started with one ETF, but literally I bought them all. And at the time I was consuming a lot of American and I'm Canadian. So a lot of Canadian literature around investing and literally bought every single ETF. And now it's like they all overlap. Also just invest in one. But the cool thing is like, you can just change your strategy, right? Yeah, I was just going to quickly touch on, I think, is it a Warren Buffett quote that the best investments are usually greeted by yawns? So I think in, in the realm of keeping it interesting, you, you kind of don't have to, you just have to make sure that you keep going. So I think what you were saying about automation is good. Finding a strategy that works and you can continue with because the work, like the investor's worst enemy is themselves. The only reason that you're not going to achieve your goals is because you stop. Um, so I, that's the way I think is tr try and automate it as much as possible. I think um, my perspective on keeping it interesting is sort of actually keeping engaged with what you want to happen at the end or like why you're investing. Because I think that disengaging from why we're trying to amass wealth is why people get greedy and they think they want more and more and more. And also why people don't stop. Like we are, we're all like, yeah, when I've got however much, I'm going to stop working. But then we're still humans and we're still, it's actually the change that you have to go through in terms of your life, your psychology, your mindset to not follow the traditional paradigm anymore is actually quite jarring. I think that you need to be really quite clear on why you're pursuing that and what it will allow you to do and why that matters to you and how that might change and maybe how other things that come into your life or other things you encounter in life are going to impact that so that you're kind of connected to why you're doing it because that keeps it interesting. Yeah. And I think, you know, I mean, not to get too kind of deep into like the patriarchy or the structures of the industry, but I think it's, you know, if you think about it for a second and you think about every app you've ever tried, except for maybe some, um, <laughs> and if you look at the, and if you look at them and you go, okay, how, how is this connected to my end goal? And if you really boil them down, then they're not connected to the end goal at all. They're connected to a transaction. And I guess my, even my question, if I think back on my question to the, just now, is a derivative of this idea that finance and shares are something to be doing, right? I don't know. Thoughts? I was just thinking about what Emma said, like, when is it enough? I mean, so a lot of people here are investors. Do you know what your end goal is? Like, what, what is enough? Like, there might be a vision, your why, but do you also know the number for it? And would you quit at that time, whatever that is? Like, it's kind of a philosophical question. It's not just math, right? Like, math is easy, but we know that finance is not just math. It's emotional. It, it's much deeper than that. So the question, I guess, is like, what is enough? And what is enough for you guys? Like, I'm just, I'm, I'm curious about that. Do you know what enough, does enough exist? I don't think I'm fully there where I quite know what enough is yet because I'm still very early in my journey and still very early in absorbing this potential future for myself. But I think you have to, throughout your life for all reasons, I think you have to be really in touch with your values and really learning what they are. I mean, even the volunteering thing that I mentioned before, that's something that I've you know realized in the last couple of years, like going through the pandemic and things like that. I was really sort of thinking about this life I didn't lead where maybe I would have worked in healthcare. Um, I studied marketing, so that was <laughs> sort of the other direction, <laughs> the worst of society. But yeah, thinking about how I can bring that into, you know, rather than being like, oh, well, I didn't do that, so I'll never realize that. Thinking about why that matters to me and how I can build that into my life. I don't know. Mathematically, I don't fully know what's necessarily enough. But again, I'm so early on. At the moment, it's like one foot in front of the other, continually investing, making sure that it's going up. I'm doing that, you know, regular dollar cost averaging, for example, and kind of keeping my finger on the pulse of that. Yeah. So Emma's number is more. <laughs> Currently, yes. Yeah. You mean yeah. 20,000 isn't enough? <laughs> I can't retire yet. <laughs> I like your point though about having a really strong why because I think a lot of people fall off the investing bandwagon because they don't go back to their why. They don't know why they're doing it, what they're trying to achieve, where they're trying to be. 
So they think, yeah, I want to invest because I want to make money. And then it's just like, okay, I don't really have a bigger goal than that. So if you think about the end goal, it actually makes committing to the strategy a lot more, a lot easier. Um, that That's my thought. Yeah, good. I mean, I think, you know, one of the things where I think we've covered here without nailing it, so we'll try and summarize it is obviously you need to keep yourself motivated. Having a vision of what that what the future looks like is good, but you actually don't know whether you're going forward or backward unless you quantify it in some way. So maybe that's a key point to take away. But I think if we pause there for a second and go, okay, we've articulated that there's this world where we need this number and we're working towards it. I think it's probably time we chat about how to get that number quicker. And this is something that I think you you all have a really interesting um, story. Each of you have found uh, a way to turn either a passion into a full-time job or, or, or a bona fide side hustle or whatever you want to call it. So let's just delve into it now. I mean, Anna, you go first. Um, for those who don't know, a newly minted author. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I think for me, it's, it's always, yes, I've had side hustles and done things, but my big focus was myself and my career. And I think for a lot of people that often is like your bread and butter, that's where you spend five days a week. That's like where most of your life is. So for me, it's always been like, how do I upskill? How do I learn the new thing? How do I get a raise? How do I increase my income that way? How do I jump jobs? So that's always been like a real big focus for me. And, um, I think like that's where I wanted to focus more of my time as opposed to a side hustle or a side job. Like no, no shade to that. That's really great when you can successfully do it. But for me, that was the trajectory of my career and what I really wanted to focus on. How has that looked though, since you got to Australia even? What, like, what are the steps? Yeah. I mean, I, I guess it's different. I think like when I was coming, so I came to Australia about 10 years ago and then I've just had a lot of roles in, in, in that time. And I really wanted to work in tech. So I moved over to tech and I upskilled there and I kept growing and also just knowing your your worth, but also at the same time on the side doing other things that kind of would, like right now I'm technically on parental leave. I'm still hustling on the side. I'm writing, I wrote a book during parental leave. Like those are things where I'm investing in myself and my earning capacity as opposed to, yeah, I don't know. Like that. that's just been my focus in, as opposed to something else. But I know other people have very different paths than mine. <laughs> than mine. Yeah, I mean, Emma, you're, you're working as a freelancer and you've got the broke gen. Talk about how you manage those two things? Yeah. So I started out in marketing and had side hustles along the way, sort of true side hustles, like cat sitting and flipping things from the op shop and that kind of thing, like really true side hustles. But I do think that when I, that that was actually the point that my financial journey changed. Sorry, just to backtrack a tiny bit to seg into side hustling. Investing, you know, has been a really interesting journey for me and it'll be a big part of my journey to not working forever, hopefully. But the day I got an ABN was actually when I found, you know, the first phase of financial freedom because it was the first time that I hadn't been shackled by minimum wage. And I actually was like, oh, I have some control here over how much money I make and I'm not capped by these ceilings that I felt like I was stuck in, especially coming from the UK to here, I find it really hard to get work. I was earning like 31K or something at like 26, 25, 26, you know, I'm already, I'm taking paces back every day. And so, you know, fast forward like six years from that all happening. Now I'm sort of running my seedling money media company while freelancing on the side as a copywriter, doing, you know, other bits and pieces that sort of fit into that somewhere. And it's a bit of a, an interesting one because it's sort of the most core definition of the multi-hyphenate career. I don't know if people have really heard of that term where you don't really do one thing and there's that horror of someone going, what do you do? And you're like, oh no, <laughs> all kinds of things. And I might be doing writing one day, social media the next, panel talks another day, borderline teaching people about money another day. And it's all this weird sort of spectrum of stuff. And maybe there'll be more things after that. Um, but I think it's sort of, it comes down to that personal branding and opening up sort of yourself as an asset, um, developing yourself as an asset and sort of, you can pay dividends too, <laughs> if you learn new skills that you can monetize and monetizing not only your skills, but your perspective and your identity and your background and your unique voice, I suppose. So I think that's been like the key part of it in terms of managing it. I think it comes down to that sort of age old debate of the hustle. Like we sort of over glorified the hustle for a bit there for all the wrong reasons. But I have to say the years that I have like hustled a bit have been the ones that have accelerated me the most, especially not coming from a background where I'm, you know, able to call up my mum and dad and say, oopsie, can I borrow five grand? 
they've been the years that have moved the needle forward the most. And I'm not saying, you know, nothing is worth your health, but there's a lot of value in having short, concentrated periods of hustle sometimes if you're doing it with intention and for yourself. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. I had the few years as well where I was obsessed with money, like really obsessed. I counted every dollar that I spent. I tried to cut back on absolutely everything. Um, I worked a lot of hours. I found a job where you could work 56 hour shifts in a row, which was fun. And they had no overtime limits. That was cool. Um, But I worked a lot. And then I think it did really well because I bought an apartment. I invested a lot, but obviously it's not sustainable forever. Yeah, you've got to know your limit. But I think there's a lot of sort of narrative now of, a full-time hustle is enough of a hustle. And I completely agree with that sort of ideology. We shouldn't actually need to be having side hustles. It's absolutely cooked that a full-time wage isn't enough to afford housing. But I mean, in the short term, if you have an appetite for something on the side or a skill or an opportunity that you have to bring in extra money, I mean, it's worked out really, really well for me to do that. It's just a cool way to try things as well. Yeah. Like starting my social media was just a random impulsive thing I did one day and now it's my whole job, which is pretty exciting. Mm. But yeah, just trying stuff is fun. And meeting people and getting connections. Again, as somebody who wasn't well connected, you know, I don't have people in high places, whereas getting out there and doing different things like social media has connected me to people that that connect you to, to more opportunities and people over time. I think your network, as they say, is quite powerful, especially if you don't really have one. Building one can pay off in the future. Brandon, it'd be really interesting to hear your, your journey from the first YouTube you made through to today. And I, I think, you know, I wasn't really aware of the scale of your operation and whatnot. And it'd be great just to talk a little bit about that. Yeah, sure. Um, So I started my YouTube channel in 2017 and the first couple of videos I made were kind of about the mistakes that I'd made as a beginner. Um, So I think like one of my first videos I made was like ETFs, what they are and listed investment companies and how that's probably probably a better starting point than dumping a whole lot of money into one company that you don't know anything about. So that was kind of how I started. I didn't really have any expectations. I don't think... um, you definitely don't go into social media thinking you're going to make a whole lot of money um, because you'd never start. So I just, I just found making videos interesting and enjoyable. And I think I was one of, one of only a small group of people doing it at the time in Australia. Um, Back then my channel was called Aussie wealth creation. (laughs) So humble beginnings. Yeah. (laughs) And I realized that I was getting no traction internationally. I couldn't figure out why that was. And then the, re- the, <laughs> the mar- marketing company said, you see that Aussie in the name? You should get rid of that. But anyway, yeah, so I just started making videos and um, yeah, just randomly people started watching them. I, I really enjoyed, you know, chatting to people in the comments and making content around or just, you know, growing my skills. And as I grew my skills and competencies, just kind of passing on or trying to boil down the concepts that I'd learned about in a way that anyone can kind of understand um, because it's quite hard to understand if you don't really, you know, if you just try and read finance jargon. Um, And then, yeah, so I've been doing it for six years now and I'm lucky enough that just as time's gone on, more and more people have have just started watching, which is cool. Did a big rebrand to New Money to try and get a little bit more international traction. That luckily worked. What else can I say? How do you make money? And when did you first make money? Yeah, I, I should say I was working as a physiotherapist for three years, like full-time three years while I was doing uh, YouTube on the side. So I was making two YouTube videos a week and doing full-time hours at the clinic uh, while the YouTube channel was growing. So I definitely didn't have like this kind of all-in moment where I was like, I'm going to turn my life around and flip it upside down and just start from scratch kind of thing. I kind of worked on both at the same time and I could see my salary or my my income from my physio job just going like that slow, like is it going to grow somewhere over there? Um, and then I could see this YouTube channel, which was starting from way down here, but it was going like that. So there was kind of a point where I hadn't quite crossed over the two lines, but I could see that tra- the trajectory was there. So at that point, I think it was at the end of 20, 2019, I just decided to go full time on YouTube and just put everything into making videos. And luckily it paid off. It was a bit risky at the time. How much money were you met? Like how much money was YouTube paying you then? Uh, probably it wasn't that much. It would have been like $3,000 a month. So I tried to originally, we just relaunched our course platform, uh, our education platform, but I had actually done a previous version of that. And we built that, uh, me and my former business partner, 
to coincide with me leaving physio as a kind of way to boost the income. So I was kind of like half a full-time salary from YouTube and I needed to fill the gap of the other half. So we created these courses to kind of supplement that income. So it was all kind of planned out. I didn't do anything absolutely nuts. Um, but yeah, that's kind of how we structured it. And then luckily the response to the course platform was really positive and, and that helped me kind of expand and go full time and really try and put 100% into YouTube. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I mean, Anna, I enjoy this story, but how has social media kind of helped in your, you know, you talked a bit about jumping roles within jobs and then and then j- jumping from job to different companies. It'd be good to just talk about how your personal brand has impacted where you where you're at today. Yeah. So I think the reason why we're talking about all these stories is for all of us like to invest. The idea is like you need money, and if you can side hustle or focus or on yourself in terms of your earning capacity, the more money you have to invest, which will allow you to have the lifestyle that you want. So just for context and like pull, trying to pull it all together, I think for me because I do did focus mainly on my like on myself and my own brand. Um, I think the story that. Nick's alluding to is that I also started kind of blogging and writing about personal finance on the side. And it just so happened that Nick found me and we connected and he's like, Hey, you work in tech, you're in product. Similarly, I was like, Oh, I've just heard of Perler. You guys are new. You're doing some cool things. Let's chat. And around that time, I, I kind of just started consulting on the side, but had I not like put myself out there and talked about what my passion was, I wouldn't have gotten into the financial space either. So I think if you're, for example, most of us have LinkedIn profiles. If you take the time to build your personal brand, even, even if like, I love all these stories of like, your stories are very different to, to mine, right? Cause you guys have businesses that you're focusing, you have social media, but we all have social media, but we have to also think of ourselves as a product or as a brand that we're selling because our time, we get paid for our time, right? Like we go to work, we do the thing. So if you can also think of yourself in that way and think of yourself as a personal brand, that was something that I really focused on because I had so many, yeah, I just thought of that. It's like, I'm invest, if I invest in myself and if I put myself forward, then hopefully that'll open doors. So that's how I kind of started working um, or consulting. I was like first consulting at Perler until I went, went over full time. And similarly, like just by talking about finance and kids and it got me and introduced me to a writer or to an author who was also like, well, you you could write a book too. And that kind of opened that door as well. Whereas if you're putting yourself out there and you're, you're like, this is what I identify with. These are my values. This is my story and continue to kind of stand behind it. Sometimes things come out of it. I mean, sometimes they don't, but if you're not doing it, you're missing out on an opportunity on yourself because I think things like LinkedIn and social media can be a really powerful tool to to sell yourself as a person or as an expert in a space. It doesn't have to be finance related. It can be marketing or whatever your expertise is. Like you have a unique voice because there's only one of you. Yeah. I mean, Tash, you sort of made an offhand comment before that you just decided to share your financial journey one day, I guess. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's obviously snowballed, but what made you do it? And would you ever have thought it would be anything like what you're doing today? No, definitely not. Um, I'm just a bit of an impulsive person. I saw my wealth diary doing it. She's a creator in the US and she was sharing her net worth updates and there wasn't really anyone I knew in Australia doing it. So I was like, oh, I'll just give it a go. And then it took off pretty quickly from there. It was during COVID time. So everyone was bored online. So that worked out quite well. Um, Yeah, it's crazy that it's become a full-time thing. Like I really, really liked my previous job and I didn't think I wanted to leave, but I kind of had to to do this stuff as well. Um, But yeah, it's been really cool. Yeah. And so like, not that we're much into like suggestions and you can go and do this and whatnot, but I, I would be keen to know, like, I mean, is someone who has a particular passion, it could be anything. Um, what are some things that you would suggest to someone who thinks they might at least want to put more time to something? They don't know whether it's going to become a career or not, but it, like, what should they do? Just do it. I get so many questions about like, oh, how do I make videos? Or how do I film this? But like, just do it and you'll figure it out. You don't need the perfect branding or the perfect colors or the perfect name. Like you can change all of that stuff. And like I started making random block color posts on Instagram. And then I decided to do TikTok, which worked out really well. But like it's changed so much since then. I think we can spend so much time planning the thing and not doing the thing. So just try stuff reach out to people, put it out there. If you're starting from scratch, do you think it's harder now? Like, I think like, I don't know if I'm as someone who's like, oh, maybe I should do the thing. Like, cause you've done it for so long. You know, like if I'm, if I'm like, oh, I want to start a thing on the side. Like, I think it's harder in finance with all the ASIC stuff now, which is a bit sad. Um, but with other stuff, no, just do it. I think it's more accessible now. More people do it. It's more normalized. Like maybe a few years ago to be like, oh, it's a bit weird to posting on TikTok, but lots more people do it now. I think um, sort of adding to what, 
Tash said, in that, that sort of in terms of the practical, like doing it, if you're like, but how do I do it? How do I say something? I would spend some time thinking of maybe five to 10 things. Obviously, it would depend on what you're talking about, but five to 10 ideas, perspectives, controversial thoughts, <laughs> not too controversial though, um, <laughs> things that you can stand behind that are uniquely yours. And then well, how can I put this out there? Can I talk about this on LinkedIn? Could I write an article about this? Could I make TikTok videos about this? Like what getting clear on what it is that you're standing behind because it probably is a little bit harder now because a lot of content niches are saturating i don't think that they're ever saturated but yeah if you've got sort of a passion for baking for example rather than just going in doing baking sort of what are some things that you know what's your hero recipe why do you love baking how did you start baking how can you tell your story that's unique to you and then you can sort of dive in I feel in. like that's so complicated like don't get stuck doing that you don't need 10 <laughs> videos just make one like film yourself cooking random cookies or something I don't yeah. know like I think that's a great idea but if I had a list of stuff like that I never would have started I just okay. made one random post one day and I was like okay cool and then from that I got other ideas mm -hmm. but I work better just making random stuff yeah if you're impulsive go for it <laughs> if you need a direction think of some things <laughs> But don't take too long. <laughs> Not too long. Just do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that's been helpful. I think what if we talk for a second about someone who's in a career, well-paid job, et cetera, and, you know, the idea of side hustles and whatnot probably aren't going to be them, but, you know, looking for ways to accelerate. Like maybe can we hear some thoughts on that? I think if we start with the goal of trying to reach or how not to work forever, like the vast majority of people aren't going to start a business like the vast majority of people are just going to work for, for the vast majority of people. In, investing is the way to start to snowball that, um, especially like if, if you want to start a side hustle or a company or something, that's that's awesome and that can be a big accelerant. But just general, like for the vast majority of people, it's going to be investing that gets you over the line and that takes many forms, you know, stock market property. But I think that that's really the focus. I think the thing to think about is just investing is a long game or as I – when we start talking about our side hustles and growing businesses and stuff like that, it's more us trying to get there sooner, I suppose, um, or trying to go bigger. But generally speaking, it's going to be investing, even just adding more to super. That's investing. That's going to be the, the way to go for most people, I'd say. Well, I didn't even mean to, but we sort of brought it back to investing and not working forever. So let's stop there before we kind of trail on. Um, let's, let's throw it to the group for some questions. Hopefully there's one or two. And they can be in any order and for anyone. And Thomas over here is going to be running around with a microphone. So does anyone have anything they want to share? Tash, you said you're pretty impulsive. How many random things did you try before you hit the nail on the head? I've worked a lot of random jobs. Um, I tried every retail job. I worked at Sizzlers for a while. Do you have Sizzlers oh. in Sydney? Was that a thing? Oh, okay. Yeah, close down in Perth as well. Um, I became a swimming instructor. I became a sport worker. I worked in like the shop. Sell you know those little ride-on like pony things the kids ride around. I hide those out for a while. Worked like footy stadiums. I tried so many things until I found the support work job that made me the most money. With social media, I tried a few different things as well. Like it was always money focused, but I post about rock climbing or what I've done on the weekend or whatever I'm thinking about. Even before that, I traveled a lot as well. Um, I became a dive master. That was really cool as well. I feel like I just said yes to a lot of things, which has worked out quite well. You try a lot of stuff. You just put yourself out there and just try it. I just get bored kind of easily, so it's fun to do new things. <laughs> and you never know if you don't try. I mean, yeah, and if you keep trying lots of different stuff, eventually we'll just land on something. Yeah. Like and that's what happened. Social media works, which is fun. Been pretty cool. Is anyone in the crowd sharing anything about, you know, a passion of theirs on social media currently? What do you do? I'm an occupational therapist as well, <laughs> Allied Health in the room. I wanted to share what I learned inside the, the clinical room um, on social media and not many people were doing it and most people don't do it because when you work full time, you have all these legal constraints around sharing information outside the workplace. So I started my own business as a sole trader and then I was like, let's go, yeah. <laughs> say what I want. I'm still confined in that my clients can see me on my public account, but I, I ride that edge between saying what I really think and feel and being really, you know, mindful that anyone can find me at any time. And now you give dating tips, were you telling me? Yeah, I give That's dating awesome. tips. <laughs> so it all started with, I just wanted to start an online business and I was looking at, and you're right, like you need capital, right? I wanted to invest in a coach and I was willing to spend 10 to 15,000 Australian at the time. 
and it took me 18 months to two years to find the right person and I just chose a mentor that was going to be right for me because I didn't feel confident to show up online, didn't know how to make a reel, didn't know how to market, you know, and it's all really awkward in the beginning. I think you've just got to be really willing to be judged, to be socially rejected, to fail. <laughs> um, and then after that started gaining some momentum, I really decided to affiliate with products as an income stream. Um, so I went high ticket, which means like high investment, high commission. And starting online made me realize I didn't know how to invest. So then I invested in learning how to invest. <laughs> so it was a real like journey of growth and exposure um, of my limiting beliefs around money. I think as a woman, you don't even think about providing for yourself at that level sometimes. So putting myself online and meeting other people, I realized that I wasn't doing a whole lot of behaviors with my money that entrepreneurs do or, you know, people who invest do. So that was kind of my journey. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Really, really amazing example of investing in yourself. Like to, to go and find a mentor and pay for that, that's that's a huge step. And like, I mean, I'm curious, what was the last thing you guys up here or even anyone out here spent real money on investing in yourself? I'm curious, personal development, teaching, something, anything. Yeah, I've spent like $4,000 to a money coaching course and you went to uni as well, Emma? Yeah, I forgot about that. I... <laughs> <laughs> Oops. Spent 24,000 Australian dollars over the course of a year um, studying a course in financial psychology to sort of niche my expertise in the Australian finance landscape. I hope what, it pays off. <laughs> what, are some, what are some things that don't cost $24,000? Any suggestions? Sorry, I thought you were looking for the smoking gun. <laughs> uh, there's free courses on Rask, I guess, if you want a free thing. Yeah? Derek agrees. Just books, I guess. What are some? Rule one. <laughs> No, I don't know. There's like, for me, like I just read a whole bunch of Warren Buffett's uh, annual shareholder letters. He just writes those each year. Yeah. He just chucks them on, like he just chucks them on the website. You can just read them. It's basically a business investing masterclass. He just updates it every year. So that's definitely helpful. What was one of the more recent books, either any of you have read that wasn't investing focus that was helpful? I read um, Chris Voss's book, which I'm blanking on what it's, it's never called. Never split the difference. Yeah, that one found that really helpful. It's kind of done the rounds, I feel, like, on social media. I read it. I can't remember when. Um, it's it's just really a good book in teaching you communication skills, uh, how to talk to people. Um, then it kind of goes into a negotiating kind of business framework of talking to people. But there's a lot of like, even if you want to hold better conversations and you know, get to know people better. There's lots of things that I learned. I'm not very, not great at talking to people. So I learned a lot of, a lot of things out of that book. So it was more of like a life skills kind of, but applicable to business kind of book. Yeah, cool. I think I saw a hand out there back there. It was a wonderful segue of communication skills. Cause my question is if you have people in your life who maybe aren't as confident or comfortable talking about money or having conversations about investing, family members, for example, do you have any advice about how to initiate those conversations? I think you can do it without being too direct, like sending them a podcast that you've listened to or a book that you've read or like sending them an article and then being like, oh, what did you think about that? Or just like putting yourself out there and being the person to do it and just start talking about it yourself. Like it can be really challenging, but if you start talking about it, it opens up doors for everyone else to start talking to you about it as well. Yeah, that's definitely what I do. Um, I just start <laughs> telling people because I'm an open book. I'll tell anyone anything. And I think sometimes it can be quite jarring for maybe people that have that conditioning that you don't say how much you earn or you don't say how much you're invoicing that client. Um, but even like Tash and I have always had a really open money relationship doing similar jobs because we'll be like, what did somebody offer you for this campaign and working out if it's higher or lower and, and kind coming of coming back as a United <laughs> front, <yeah. laughs> standardizing our rates <laughs> so that if we go, yeah, you were unionizing so that if we go in higher, like that's been beneficial to both of us, like, especially me, who's like struggles a bit more to charge bigger money. Um, and it's been the same with all my other self-employed friends as well. I'll just share massively. Um, and even family members, like my in-laws were always like, how much was that? If you don't mind me asking. And I'm like, here are all the details <laughs> because I'm just an open book. So I think that often is like the olive branch and it normalizes it for people and makes it, they're like, oh my God, the world didn't end because I asked how much your surgery cost. Or like I got my veneers done and people were like so desperate to know how much. And I'm like, I'll tell you, <laughs> I'll give you a recommendation, you know? Um, I think it just kind of neutralizes that initial jarring feeling. Mm, I think the 
you and you and Tash kind of colluding or sharing, whatever. It's an interesting one too for people with a salary job too, because it's a. I think the thing that I found out at somewhere along the journey was you should really read your employment contracts and figure out how much they put confidentiality onto you and whatnot. Because I think um, one of the simplest things any of us can do as you know employees is talk to our colleagues and figure out what the hell's going on and whether all being paid the same or whether there's someone getting paid more or groups that are being paid less, right? So that's really interesting. I don't know whether... Yeah, like I, I think like pay transparency is a really important one if you're working in an organization where um, it's kind of frowned upon. Like, <laughs> at, like I've been in a situation where I've had colleagues openly want to talk about pay transparency, but it was always it was also nice that they gave the option of talking about it as well. Because sometimes if you are on the receiving end of finding out that someone's paid more than you or less than you, it can be a really difficult conversation. So I've been on both sides of, of those conversations before. And um, so if you do have those conversations, it's sometimes really good to be like, would you like to know how much I'm getting paid so that you can have an open conversation, but it allows people to kind of have a moment for themselves to be like, am I ready to take this information in? Because if, um, if you are finding out that you're underpaid for whatever reason, those are hard conversations to have. But like anything, talking about money is really impactful. Talking about your salary is really impactful. Talking about any kind of like packaging around that is really important because if the more information you have, the better you can negotiate, the better you can advocate for yourself and the better you can advocate for other people. So in the case that you do know your employee, your colleague is underpaid, but you're doing the same work, you can be a unified front. And there are companies that do have pay transparency, which is amazing. It's like it opens the doors um, for those conversations as well. Yeah, I'm always the first person at after work drinks to announce my salary and ask if anyone would like to discuss. And um, it's it's quite a bonding experience, I have to say. It's quite good. I did this at my job as well. And a lot of people I was working with thought that they couldn't ask for a pay rise because we worked in healthcare. And I was like, oh no, you, you can ask, go and ask. And then a few of them did, which was awesome. What's the tip on asking for a pay rise? I just ask. I'm probably not the best person to ask. I'm not very subtle. <laughs> I negotiate with Nick quite well. I say, pay me more, please. But that's a different situation than your boss. And I think it, like if it's your your boss, like being able to show that you have value, that you've created value, that you're actually uh, working towards the objectives of the company. What I love to do is like write down all my wins, like, oh, I've, I've increased this metric or I've done this X, Y, and Z. If you put that aside, you can use that for a resume in the future. You know what I mean? But it's also wins that you can show that your company, that you're actually increasing value. So if you kind of sit down, make sure that your objectives are on the same page as your employer, come back in three months and then renegotiate that. Like there's, there's been times where I found out that I was underpaid in a company and have been able to prove that and then got an increase to be in line with other people or whatever it might be. But that's, I feel very passionate about this yeah. topic um, as I've been on both sides. Employers definitely just want their business to succeed. So if, if you, as an employee can show them how you're making their business succeed more and quantify it, then they should have no worries with paying you more. It's also a really good way to weed out employers that don't care if you live or die as well, because I've been in that situation where I've, you know, put the deck together and the writings on the wall that I'm really not earning enough here. And here's all the value that I provide. And here's why it's going to cost you way more than the 10 or 15 K I'm asking for to replace me. And some of them just still won't budge. And the sooner you know that, the better, because they will gaslight you into thinking they care about your development. And sometimes they just don't, or they can't, and they're not capable of it. So even trying that, even if it doesn't work, it's still a win because you can get out of there <laughs> and move somewhere else if that's possible in your industry. Especially in, I think now with unemployment really low, like that, that's what, with your job hopping, you, what was your statistic you told me that wowed me? You increase your income by how much? Yeah, four times. Four times. But I mean, it's over like a period no, of six years. No, don't justify it. Six get years. Cold. But you know what I mean? Like, it's not like a short period of time. It still took a while, but. I'll take four X in six years. Yeah. Well, it was, it was also like low, low paid job to start at. You know, uh, but yeah. yes, like, I mean, that that is impactful, right? Like those yeah. things are impactful. I just wanted to say something else when it comes to negotiation. This is often you hear that like women don't negotiate their 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 salary or they, I just want to demystify like women do. It's just that we have biases in their society that often feel that women 
are bossy when they ask for those things or and oftentimes like it gets pulled under the table from them where it's like well we gave you a job offer but you're being pushy and therefore we don't want to so these are things that do happen in society there's stats and research that proves this so i just wanted to bring this out that um often we hear these things like oh women don't don't actually negotiate their wage they don't they don't try hard they're not you know, they, they are and we are so i just for for the women in, in, who are here like i just want to know like you are seeing like it's it, it's a it's a hard place because we all have biases that come into play um when it comes to that kind of stuff mm. emma when you said you like laid out the deck i think that was your expression was that a figure of speech or did you actually do a presentation i did it on uh like powerpoint yeah. i didn't like print it out <laughs> but yes i put together a collection of evidence of like where i wanted to go the value i was adding my ideas for the business. It was a really small business. Yeah, didn't didn't work all that well. But like that's a shame because there was someone that was my boss at that role was someone that was in my life for a long time. Like I'd worked there for a really long time and it sort of looked as though there was growth there, but I was just like stagnating every year. And I kind of I was getting more engaged with my finances at this time. And at first it was like, well, you know, I'm earning like 48K, like I could probably get 60 somewhere else. And then every year that passed, I was like, um, every year that I'm 5, 10, 15K underpaid, I'm losing that compounding effect and I'm losing the ability to jump. Like while I'm on 48, my next jump will be that 60. If I never get to 60, I never get to the next jump. So um, yeah, it was a presentation situation to answer your question in a really long winded way. No, you make I mean, such that, good presentations. They're so good. I love a presentation. Yeah. <laughs> No, but I think that, I mean, you, you just, you got to go into these things prepared and it, it, whether you actually have a presentation or you do articulate your thoughts in some way to make sure you turn up and you don't melt. Yeah, it depends on your role. If you can, you know, if you have the capacity for visual representation, representations of data, then it might work better. Whereas if you're more using anecdotes, then maybe it's less appropriate. Sounds like a silly person. What does? Not you. Oh. <laughs> the employer. Oh yeah. <laughs> I mean, also businesses like we're small businesses too. Businesses have capacity ceilings. So sometimes it, it's actually finding out that that alignment has, has hit that ceiling because if they can't provide what you need, it's not going to be great for either of you, unfortunately. Anyone got a different topic we want to chat about? I have a question for Brandon. Um, you have a YouTube channel and um, uh, I think you said you went full-time in 2019. At what point in your journey did you realize the potential for a digital product or at what level of subscribers? I was wondering if you could talk more about that and how you transitioned from having that YouTube channel and a market and using that to, I guess, sell, I think it was profitful and now you got the other digital yeah. product as well. Yeah, that's right. I don't know if I have a really good answer for that, actually. Uh, I think I Profitful was born out of necessity because I knew where I wanted to be and I knew I wanted to do YouTube full time. I was getting a little bit sick of physio. It was nice to help people and, and all that, but just the relentless, you know, doctors and all allied health, it's just relentless, just patient after patient after patient after patient after patient. It just doesn't stop. And 40 years later and your thumbs don't work anymore and it's just not a great time. So I knew, I think I was, I want to say around maybe five, only 5,000 subscribers on YouTube back in the day. And that's when I, when I could see, cause you could just see growth. I mean, the growth was continuing. So I was like, okay, this is probably going like nothing short, but I was like, this is probably going to continue. I knew I wanted to, to do full time uh, YouTube and I knew that there was an income gap that needed to be filled. I had no, idea. I probably should have done more research, but I just made it. I just went out and made it. So I'm not sure if I have a really good answer to your question, but um, I think I was kind of just lucky that people that followed the channel kind of supported the vision and were also just trying to help me out. And then we got there in the end. <laughs> Is there anything else to kind of answer that better? I'm, I'm not really sure. <laughs> okay, like how do you rate the digital product as like a side hustle or a side income? Because oh, there's, there's a lot of benefits to it, super, right? You don't, yeah. you don't need to be involved. You can make it and then it can just sell forever basically. Yeah. And you can have the market there, which, you know, keeps growing as well because yeah. Instagram grows, your YouTube goes, grows. Yeah. So, how would you like rate that in terms of comparatively putting time and effort into that versus other side hustles? That's what I'm curious to know. Yeah, it's super valuable because you're right, it's totally scalable. And this is the thing, like I, I, I learned about investing and I started talking about investing for my digital products, but it can be anything really. Like if you're a carpenter, you can show off your carpentry skills in some sort of video course and, and sell it. If you, can, if you can sell, if you can create, if you can use social media as a tool, which is like one of the, if not the most powerful tool in the world, you can create digital products out of any expertise and everyone's got an expertise. Like when I say to people, you should 
start doing some online stuff, maybe some social media, just get some exposure. They're like, ah, oh, but you know, I'm just a lawyer. It's like, yeah, we'll start making content about being a lawyer. I think a lot of people need to, even if, if they're in a business, if, if they're in a just a typical profession, they need to think, okay, I am a plumber and I'm a media company. I am a carpenter and I am a media company. And making content around that is incredibly beneficial. And then if you can combine that with a digital product, I'm not sure what what, a, what everybody's expertise is, but there's definitely a way you can boil down pretty much every expertise into some form of teaching resource that you can then sell. And, you know, if it's, you know, you just make it interesting and engaging and it'll find an audience. There's billions of people that access social media. That's the other thing that people say is that I don't have anything to talk about or people won't want to watch what I make. There's enough people out there that you you will be someone's favorite channel. So you just can you show your favorite channel that you watch too much? <laughs> Are you gonna can everyone guess what Brandon's favorite YouTube channel yeah, is? Yeah. There's the, oh, there, that's one of them. No, that's, no, it's not. No, it's something way more no, boring. That's the building one. Yeah, I know. Yeah, it's lawn mowing. Lawn mowing. It's like time lapses, like forty minute time lapses of lawn mowing. But they're so good because you start them and then in five minutes time you're asleep. So it's like perfect. It it achieves the goal that I need it to achieve. No, it just auto plays and then there's it more. It does auto lawn play. Mowing. And then you, you wake up at one in the morning and it's like, <laughs> and you're like, oh geez, what is that? So what? I like lawn mowing videos, all right? I just can't believe no, how well on. it does. Surely it, so, someone's got, you guys got to be on my team a little bit. Some sort of satisfying videos. I like the short ones on Instagram, yeah. like the garden makeovers, but yeah. that's not 40 minutes. No, this yeah. is like boring lawn mowing. Yeah, he, well, he, does so well. the, he does so well. He does so well out of it. One of the paid YouTubers a few years ago, they made slime and then they squished it between their fingers. That's it. I just, that's their whole business. They make slime and they pick it up they turn the camera on and they just squish it. And they make millions of dollars. And this goes back to the point, right? <laughs> There's a niche for everything. It doesn't matter what your interest is. Anyway, does anyone else watch those weird, satisfying videos? My partner. Yeah. yeah. Like pressure washing? Anyone <laughs> Anyone pressure washing? Yeah, lawn mowing. What's some other ones? Just shout them. Drain clearing. Drain oh. clearing. Oh. Shoe they stick the thing in the drain, then they pull it out. It's disgusting. It looks like a poop. Oh, hydraulic oh, yeah. press. I don't understand. They can literally break anything. They can break anything. Anyway. So um, my name's Derek. I had a question. Oh, so the comment first was people can make a video about anything. I needed to change the cabin filter in my car recently. And there's a guy in the UK. If the car is on the market in the UK, he's got millions of views of how to change a cabin filter. I was like, wow. Okay. Genius. Yeah. Um, the question I had was, I guess, about the cooperation between all of you. So I know Queenie's here and Phil Moscatello walked in before. So like the way you all work together is super collaborative and you all co-present and interview each other and so on. So like, how does that work and how does that all help? your own individual businesses. I like having co-workers. Like it can be really lonely being online. So it's nice to message people and talk to them. And I also think I'm not the person for everyone. Like you, we all relate to different people and we all bring different things to the space and there's room for so many people to be part of it. I think it better, like the more people talking about money, the better it is. It's also interesting because while it is a technically we're each other's competitors, but if Emma's content does better, it means that more people see it, which also means that more people see Tasha's content. Yeah, and when Emma charges more, I get to charge more. Yeah. So that's great. So the, it, technically, like technically, we're all competing for attention as the commodity that we compete for. But it's a weird system where the better we all do, the better everyone else does, which I think is great. I like it. <laughs> it's a weird one, though. It's also the better the, the viewer does, like especially in the financial space, I think, right? Like I... Ultimately, I would think that most of our mission or thoughts is like, how can other people be better with their finances? Right. And, and that's it goes back to that why of investing. Like, what's your why for investing? Like, what's your why for your content? And really, I think for the most part is like, what's an easier way for us to achieve wealth or not have to work forever or to have freedom or to be financially secure or to pay off our debt. Like all those, that's like a deeper why as well. I think that connects to the viewer to the yeah. end. I don't really see it as competing either. Like there's enough marketing money for everyone. Like I've never been like, oh my God, I'm so jealous of them getting that thing because I can probably get it as well. It's like, oh, that's cool. Now I'm going to go after that thing as well because I've seen that it's possible. Like Queenie's working with Thermomix and I really want to work with Thermomix. <laughs> that's my goal now. Thank you. Um, just like a slightly different 
perspective because you know Perla's uh, um, part of part of the DNA of Perla was trying to get people to talk more about money and use those insights of the community to help people learn more right so we figured that if one individual could tap into the experiences of tens of thousands or millions of people and then figure out that there wasn't some secret then that could be really powerful right but so one of the ways we do that is we support content creators and there's really lots of reasons why we work with the people we work with but if you think about the internet and um it's a pretty weird and dark place and so if you're not supporting the people you think are doing good work then what's going to happen is someone inferior is going to step into that role that's either going to be some sort of crypto dm bot or whatever right and and that's going to bring down the quality right so i think there's there's a huge part of you know working together strengthens the industry which is in its infancy right like let's not pretend that there have been content creators talking about finance and ets for a long time it's still really early if we can continue to build each of these brands and businesses and we can be part of that community and we can all grow ourselves then that builds trust in the industry and it builds the better quality and then it maybe inspires other people to do better work as well and we all benefit from that so i think that was just like a slightly different take i don't know i mean we all work with each other in different perspectives uh, maybe it's interesting to talk about the you know challenges or, or the good things about working together i don't know the good things about working with pala is that what you want i'll ask a more direct question you you have to work with some very big companies you're you're a sole trader individual um and you've learned a lot i imagine over the last couple of years you've had things that have gone well and not well i be i think hearing that story and the things you've learned is an interesting story yeah it's interesting working with companies like perla who are real humans and they value the same things that i do versus other companies that aren't it's been really interesting getting to know like get to see behind the scenes of certain companies and just being like wow that does not align at all but yeah it's been really fun working with companies that do align but others will just like underpay you by 30 cents and never pay it back which is annoying. I love um, how bitter you are. Oh my about gosh, that. it ruins my like zero accounting. It, it was very annoying. It just ruins your accounting. Yeah. Wait, wait, wait. You mean like yeah. 30 cents per thing or like just 30 cents? No, no, I charged them like $2,500 and they paid me 2,497, no, 99 something something. I was like, "What? Why? Like why are you doing that to me?" And they still owe you. Yeah, no. 6 months ago, I haven't paid me back. <laughs> What is it 30 cents? Yeah, something mm -hmm. 30 40 cents, something annoying. Yeah. Your accountant's just like Where's that 30 cents? Yeah, me. No, I'm like where is it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, cool. Any more questions? Oh, yep, up the back is a few. You've all mentioned personal values a few times throughout the night, and I just want to understand how you navigate investing in things that might not align with your personal values given that ethics and money don't always have the clearest of correlations, mm -hmm. and how you propose people do that given that investing in something that's going to give you the best return might be something that ethically does not align with your own personal values. Maybe this is the wrong arena for this thought, but <laughs> I can't lie and say I don't sometimes lie awake at night wondering if the world I actually want pays me dividends. Do you know what I mean by that? On a much more micro level to actually answer your question, um in terms of if you are, you know, going to do it, it's exploring what you're investing in. And I think thinking about your values and then thinking about what can get you the biggest return, I think money's one of the most powerful ways to actually call you at your word because a lot of people say that they believe in such and such ideologies and then they the way their money is invested goes completely against that and you know if that's you know what they they're comfortable with that's fine but i think it is it's actually a good prompter of your exploration of your own values um obviously it depends what you're investing in there are different ways to kind of explore how that does align um i think unfortunately it can come down to where the line is for you i mean is anything really that clean it depends how far you go with it but i think it is finding that comfortability level you know what kind of you know not all esg is created equal what are the filters that matter to you um some of them are a lot more granular than others um and also it's a difficult one being open to your values changing or the things that you invest in potentially clashing with your values in the future and i guess getting familiar with the degree to which you're willing to lose money or or able to lose money i mean there's an element of privilege in in living with your values in a way and kind of thinking about how you'll deal with that if you realize that you are invested in weapons for example how are you going to handle that are you going to sell them right now are you going to wait is it going to be a decision you make going forward you know there's no clear right or wrong but yes what there's a lot of ways to make a lot of money it depends which ones that actually help you sleep at night. 
I think thinking a little bit longer term as well, like a lot of the ethical ETFs have underperformed recently that are excluding all the oil and gas companies. Um, obviously, petrol prices have gone up recently. Um, but if you think longer term, some of those more ethical companies might win out in 10, 20 years, for example. Because when you look at like, what is it, Ethi or the other ones now, you might be like, oh no, that's not doing too well. But thinking longer term, what you really want from it. And not being perfect either. It's really hard to get a perfectly ethical investment. I do think that there's a slight expectation, particularly now that more women are participating in investing. There's a lot more pressure to be ethically clean with your investing. Women can only have money if it's okay with everyone else, you know? Yeah. Well, Perla has a stat on how many females hold ethical ETFs. Is it 70% of the ethical ETFs held by women? Yeah. So um, just to provide a little bit of context to that, our customer-based community is roughly it, well, it is. It's it, it's even on a gender split, um, and that is the same. F- if you look at all the different sectors of ETFs and stocks and everything, it's pretty much the same, except when it comes to ESG ETFs. Whereas Tash said that there's a huge skew towards women, and I mean, I, I don't know whether that's um, you know something that you mentioned, Emma, like uh, that expectation or guilt or whatever you want to call it. I don't know, or whether it's marketing. But uh, I, what I would say is that it's you know a, you know a relatively new concept. So shares have been around for a really long time. Indexes have been around for quite a long time. And and this concept of ESG is still evolving. And so two things I would say would be research what ESG means and then just look at the companies. And you start to, my my suggestion would be start to form your own filter as like, okay, if there's a company in there that I'm just like, I, I can't do it, find that threshold. And, and then you start to figure out your way. The other thing I will say is that I, I came across someone who gave me a really, it kind of changed my whole perspective on ESG and how someone would deal with it recently. And it kind of went a bit like this because I was sort of saying, where would you put ESG in a portfolio or how would you build an ESG portfolio, right? And instead of saying, well, I would just have all of these ESG ETFs, they approached it and said, well, I, I'm actually going to do a portfolio of like 80%, n- like no filter, just index, and I'm going to have like 15, 20% ESG. And I'm going to do that because I want to be investing in that space. But at the moment, it's a little bit unproven. It's expensive. And, you know, I, I can't quite afford to really, in my head, go the whole way. And the plan was like over time to go as the industry evolves, as costs come down, as things get more clear to ratchet that up. And so I guess it was just an interesting example of where like ESG doesn't have to be this one or other, but it could even be an evolution or a journey where you go, okay, within five years or within 15 years, all of my investing is going to be ESG and I'm going to start small. And I thought that was a like that from a finance person's perspective, blew my mind. You know, it's so simple, but Another thing I was just going to say is one thing that makes me feel a little bit better is if you, if I'm buying 10 ExxonMobil shares, girl, I hate oil, and I buy them, you know, I send it to the broker, then I'll get connected with another investor and I'll buy the shares off the investor. So the money from me will go to the investor. So you're not directly, if you're just buying shares in the open market, you're not directly supporting the company that you buy. You are indirectly supporting it though, because en masse, a lot of so yeah no on mass a a lot of yeah a lot of people buying shares in exxon mobil will take a lot of exxon mobil shares out of circulation which will help support their stock price which will allow them to raise capital at a higher price or more easily or something like that somehow the last question we got could have been an entire panel of itself and i think i'm getting waved at to try and wrap it up so i think we're done okay awesome well look thank you so much everyone and um thank you to the panelists um but for everyone for sitting in this like rapidly warming room and and for choosing to spend a couple of hours with us it's um it's a privilege to be able to do this it's a fun thing for us to do we learn so much by talking to you and hopefully we can all go away and take what we learn and um come back with better content better product better courses better everything so thank you again thanks guys Thanks so much for joining us. If you found this episode helpful, please rate us five stars, write a review, or share with a friend. If you're new to investing, make sure to listen to our first 10 episodes. Follow us at Get Rich Slow Club or Tash at Tash Invest or me at Anna Christina. This show was brought to you by Natasha Edgman, who is an authorized representative, 12-99881 of Guideway Financial Services, AFSL 420367 and Perla, who is an authorised representative, 128-1540 of Sanlam Private Wealth, AFSL 337-927. Knowledge is power. 
especially when it comes to investing. So make sure you check out our financial services guides and read the product disclosure statement and target market determination for any investments you're considering. See our show notes for more info.